recording. Perfect. All right. So um, thank you very much for um, joining today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the different pathways of immigration to Canada and more specifically, what have been the updates from IRCC over the past few weeks and months, uh, which have affected many of the provincial and federal programs. I'll start with a quick introduction of our team. My name is Maria Garces Cabels. I'm a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, and I've been with the Incubate team for almost four years now. Um, I specialize in economic based immigration. I have assisted many clients from international students, skilled professionals to citizenship applications. So, with this, we kindly ask to keep everyone on mute, please. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce our principal consultant and managing director, Mr. Basil Sauter. Um, he comes with over 10 years of combined US and Canadian immigration um, law experience. So um, he's also very specialized in the economic-based immigration, anything from business immigration, skilled worker uh, to citizenship as well. A little bit more about our team and who is behind the scenes of uh, making incubates magic. We have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, all our employees um, spread across our offices, which I'll show in a second. Um, and the reason we show this slide is pretty much to reflect that we all come from different backgrounds. Most of us were born or raised outside Canada and came to Canada, whether through a temporary resident status or permanent residency. And most of us did it in um, a unique or different way. So we're gonna be talking about these different ways in today's presentation, but again, special focus on IRCC's updates. All right, so we have three licenses in house um, and we are authorized um, to represent clients all across Canada any province and territory, including Quebec as well. And we have four offices um, in Canada, Toronto being our biggest one, Vancouver, where I am located today, Calgary, our newest one, and Montreal as well. Um, so whether you decide to visit at, at one of our offices or whether you um, decide to uh, visit us online, we're happy to assist you. We've processed many, many applications in the past um, eight years, and we've worked not only with um, skilled workers all over the world, but also international students, schools, um, and employers here in Canada to make sure we can tailor their needs to their staff, students, or their uh, immigration goal to their needs. We do offer our services in five languages, so English and French, as well as Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic, so you feel more comfortable reaching to us, reaching out to us. Um, in any of these languages, please feel free to do so. We'll be happy to assist you. And without further ado, let's jump into how we can help. Um, and then we'll jump into the actual content. So um, we do offer, or we can assist you in many types of ways, services or applications. We divide this into main categories. We have temporary resident services, what we call TRS. So anything from visitor, uh, visas, ETAs, study permits, work permits, and extensions of such, as well as permanent resident services, PRS, anything from creation of expression of interest profiles to actual PR applications, provincial applications, and citizenship applications. Now, let's dive in into the actual uh, content and the reason why you're joining us here today. How can I immigrate to Canada? How can I obtain my Canadian permanent residence? Okay, first things first, uh, becoming a Canadian permanent resident is similar uh, to that of a citizen, but there's some differences. Uh, we could compare it to, uh, for example, the green card in the US, and a permanent residence card is issued for five years. We have to comply with our um, the permanent residency requirements in order to maintain it or meet certain requirements in order to become a citizen after that. We do not have the right to vote or the right to passport or hold certain um, government positions while being permanent residents, but anything else, um, it's pretty much very similar to being a Canadian citizen. Now, how do I become one? What are the main routes that we find for immigration to Canada? Well, we can immigrate to Canada through the temporary, um, temporary route. So whether we were coming as a student or as a worker to Canada, 
whether that means through a provincial or a federal program. We could also immigrate with our skill set, our languages as a skilled professional and be selected under one of the many programs, both at a federal and at a provincial level. We could also immigrate through investments, through our entrepreneurship experience um, under any of the provincial and federal um, business immigration routes or entrepreneurship routes. Or we could be sponsored by family members, whether that's a spousal sponsorship or a family sponsorship, such as parents and grandparents. And last but not least, also obtain permanent residency if we're in need of asylum and refugee in Canada and we qualify for such. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on the first two ones, so immigrating to Canada as a student worker as well as a skilled professional, because it goes in hand with the news that we are going to be diving in today and the latest IRCC updates on the express entry system. So focusing specifically on the skilled professional route, we can use many of our factors combined to choose one route for immigration. For example, we can choose to uh, focus on one of Canada's official languages, whether that's English or French, in combination with other factors, um, could give us enough points to apply under one of the federal or provincial programs. So with the use of languages, uh, we can also use both languages, um, and this will become a popular topic in the next few slides, as you'll see. Um, specifically French here, if we are French speakers or have some sort of French proficiency, um, we could utilize that in combination with our English proficiency to apply under one of the federal or provincial immigration programs. Also through studies in Canada in public institutions that could open up our doors to one of the many provincial programs for international students, for international graduates, or also allow us to obtain the famous post-graduation work permit and acquire qualified work experience um, to apply later on for a provincial or a federal program. Work experience in Canada, whether that's with that post-graduation work permit, with a closed work permit um, that's been issued based on a job offer, we can also um, go through the route of, of, have, of using, utilizing that work experience to apply under one of the federal or provincial immigration programs, or through having a job offer in one of, uh, from one of the qualified Canadian employers, uh, again, both at a federal and a provincial level, we can look at the different options. And last and definitely not least, because it's also a big topic of discussion in today's presentation, the in-demand occupation, should we have experience in an occupation that's currently considered as in demand, both at a federal or at a provincial level, we could also choose a route to apply for immigration or get invited to apply for immigration. Now, how does the system really work? How do we get invited? How do the points work? Um, right, we have to look at three different levels of selection. So unlike immigration systems of many other countries, the majority of immigration programs in Canada require you to get an invitation to apply, require you to receive an invitation or a notification of interest, either at a federal or a provincial level. We have the, the first level, which is the federal level. This means that we get selected directly from IRCC based on our score, under the express entry system, and we apply directly with IRCC. We're dealing just with one entity here. Um, express entry system, it's a point-based system that we'll explain in the next few slides. And it's for those who have intentions to reside outside of Quebec. Quebec, we'll see that has its own immigration selection system. We can also look at a second level here, which is at a provincial level, just like provinces have the authority and legislation over their um, education and, um, for example, medical system, they also have a saying on their immigration selection that comes to that province. And for that, they create uh, provincial nominee programs, uh, which are designed to target or to attract certain groups of foreign nationals, foreign workers to come and reside to that province. There are many subcategories for each of these programs. Usually we see anything between four to eight programs per province. Um, there's, there'll be programs designed for healthcare workers, there'll be pro programs designed for in-demand occupations, international students, those with experience in the province, 
Um, as of today, there are over 60 programs, provincial programs. So um, there's quite a lot out there. Um, it's about finding the right fit for you and confirming that you meet the eligibility requirements for that program. Generally speaking, we have to prove ties to that province. So we have to either be residing there and have intentions to reside there in the long term or show uh, through documentation how we intend to move to that province and make that our home. Um, applying to a provincial level, what it basically means is that we get selected by the province. If approved, we receive a nomination certificate. And with that nomination certificate, we can go back to the federal government and submit our PR, our permanent residency application. At the end of the day, it will be IRCC, so the federal government who will um, approve or refuse our PR application. The provincial government does not have the authority to do so. What they can do is recommend you to that uh, federal program, and then the federal government will be the ones who check your admissibility, securities, background check, and so on. So it's a two-step process whenever we are applying for a province, but for many, provincial nominee programs have become the only way to immigrate to Canada. So definitely worth taking a look um, in one of the provinces that you are um, seeking to, to move to. And lastly, Quebec, um, similar or equivalent to the provincial nominee program IDEA, Quebec also has its own selection system. Um, we call it ARIMA. It's very similar to Express Entry. There's two additional programs that we will discuss towards the end of the presentation. But ARIMA works in a very similar way like Express Entry. It will select candidates based on points. But here it's mandatory to either have an advanced level of French um, or a job offer in certain occupations outside of um, Montreal metropolitan area. So there's more requirements and more fine print that we have to look um, into Quebec. And But the idea is to um, at least have an upper intermediate to advanced level of French. Once we've received the support from Quebec and we our application has been successfully processed, we go back to the federal government and they'll be the ones who uh, will finalize the processing of that application, just like I explained for the provincial nominee programs, checking through admissibility, securities, and medicals, and so on. All right. Um, up next, let me pretty, pretty quick here. Um, and these times do tend to change a lot. Uh, from experience, we're seeing shorter processing times these days, but it is really case by case. Um, based on the family size, complexity of your application. Uh, generally speaking, and we are applying through a provincial nominee program, we're looking at anything from a year to a year and a half as of today. Really depends on the province. Provinces like British Columbia are quite fast at processing applications. Processes like on, provinces like Ontario are more demanded and do require uh, more time or are taking longer to process, more on the four to six month mark. So after, as I explained, after that provincial nomination, we go ahead and um, apply for permanent residency with the federal government, which can take anything from six to nine months based on current processing times. Okay. Now, how does the express entry system work? As I was just explaining, um, it is a system that the government uses to select candidates at a federal level, meaning for all those candidates who are eligible and intending to apply or move outside of Quebec. Okay. Um, Express Entry has changed over the last few months, and this is the, the big news that we will be covering over today. Uh, but let's start with the basics and, and show you a little bit how it works. Uh, when it was first introduced over eight years ago, it was designed with the idea to expedite um, the processing of permanent residency application, but also create a first system that selects candidates based on their skills. So um, it's a system, it's a point-based system where the combination of certain factors will give us a specific score that will pretty much determine the likelihood of us getting invited to apply and hence being able to apply for permanent residency. So it's not a first come person basis, um, what we used to see prior to 2015. It's a best in first out, as in if we have the highest score, we'll be one of the first ones to get selected in under one of the rounds of invitations, which usually take place every two to three weeks. Now, what are the factors under the system that give us that score and determine the likelihood of receiving that invitation to apply? 
we're looking at four key selection factors. We have languages, English and French are both equally recognized by the federal government. And there are specific tests that we need to take to demonstrate this proficiency. For English, we have the IELTS general training or the Suffolk general test. And for French, we have the TEF Canada and the TCF Canada. Language is arguably the most important factor in under either express entry or a provincial nominee program, as it tends to work as the more uh, amount of points, the higher score we get. So our number one recommendation is always to focus on languages if possible. Education number two is also very important. If we've completed our education outside Canada, we should do what we call an ECA, an Educational Credential Assessment, and get it equalized, get it assessed by uh, one of the designated organizations. This will lead into a report that will pretty much um, show that your studies completed in this foreign country are equivalent to a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in Canada. And it is advisable that you do this for every post-secondary degree or diploma that you obtain, if not at least your highest um, level of education, if, for example, it's a master's or a PhD. Work experience, whether that's outside or inside Canada, it needs to be in a qualified occupation for at least one year. And what year translates into 12 months working at least 30 hours per week. We'll talk in a second about what a qualified occupation means, but it has to be classified as a tier zero, one, two, three under the National Occupational Classification System. And last and definitely not least, but nothing we can do about it, is H. H does affect our express entry points, our express entry profile. And once we reach the age of 30, we start losing points for every year that we turn. Unlike the federal system, so unlike express entry, we'll see that many provincial programs do not consider age as a selection factor, meaning that for those who express entry is no longer an option because of age, we might wanna look into available provincial nominee programs um, that do not take this factor into consideration. And we can compensate with other factors such as, for example, work experience, the years of work experience that you have in that in-demand occupation. So um, do not panic too much if we are uh, worried about the age factor. There's ways to overcome this um, discounts, okay? Uh, now, very important, and we'll show in the next few slides, the current draws, the current cutoff score has increased, has increased significantly over the past two years, especially since the pandemic. We're looking at a healthy score, anything that's 490 points or above, ideally actually anything that's 500 points and above, which sounds sort of crazy because it's a very high score um, and it's almost impossible to get for, for many candidates. But let's not lose hope yet. We're gonna look into some potential solutions over the next few slides. Just wanna leave that out there that anything that's 490 or 500 and above, it's what we wanna be at when it comes to express entry. Anything below that, we may wanna be looking at other options such as federal, sorry, provincial programs. Um, just a quick formula here on how we could maximize that score. Having an advanced, and when I say advanced, is the highest level of the language in one of the official languages, whether that's English or French. Um, having at least a master's or above degree in education, work experience of at least three years full time, because that's the maximum points we get awarded for experience for three years, and being under the age of 30. This combination of points will give us anything between the 480, 490 points. But as I said, we need to do a little extra to be above the 490, 500 points, which we'll show in the next few slides. Something very important here, um, especially if you're in Canada at the moment studying or planning to do so, um, the combination of your previous foreign education, such as a bachelor's degree or a three-year diploma or above, with a one-year diploma or certificate in Canada, whether that's in a public or a private institution, will give you the same transferability points for education as a master's degree. So the combination of foreign bachelor's degree with one year diploma in Canada, and that's at least eight months in academic studies, um, will give us the same transferability points for education as a master's. All right, now what has been happening over the past few months, over the past few weeks? Um, since 
the pandemic started, there was a big pause on the rounds of invitations on the number of candidates that were invited to apply, because just like many other industries and sectors, IRCC was impacted by um, the pandemic and how were they able and had the capacity to process applications. A lot of applications got delayed, processing times um, skyrocketed to years. Um, and there was a couple dark years there for, for immigration when it comes to those processing times. Um, so what happened um, is that the government focused for that time being on those who were inside Canada, specifically applying under the Canadian experience class. So many of those candidates that had been waiting there for months or that were qualified to apply under another program that was not uh, for the Canadian experience class were affected by these pause. Finally, July of last year, uh, the government restarted these um, invitations to apply, these trusts for all candidates. Um, so we started to see things getting back to normal. And shortly after, the former Minister of Immigration did announce that the government was going to utilize or wants to start using the express entry system as a way to recruit foreign talent to fill in labor shorts just in Canada. The way that we're going to do that is by what we call category-based draws. So up until then, express entry draws invited candidates based solely on the score. Of course, we had to meet the eligibility requirements, have certain factors um, in order to even open an express entry profile, and have the score that's within the selection score range to receive that invitation to apply. Nothing else. We didn't really care if you were a marketing manager or if you were a plumber. As long as you had, you were eligible to have that express entry profile and you had the score that was being selected, um, you would most likely would receive an invitation to apply. What these new category based draws introduced was the idea of selecting candidates based on their experience, based on their skill set, in order to be able to fill those labor shortages in Canada. So, this is not a new program, this is not a new system. It is a way for the government to select candidates out of the express entry pool. So we still have to be eligible to um, have an express entry profile and um, meet one of the eligibility requirements of the federal programs, either they're the federal skilled worker, Canadian experience class, the federal skilled trades or the provincial nominees and have experience in one of what we call the in-demand sectors or one of the categories that we see listed here. So this is not replacing, first question that we get, and um, probably what most people are concerned about, this is not replacing the general draws. The government will still continue to issue invitations for the general draws, but we will see a change on the cutoff score, on the minimum score that we need for this general draws. Um, there's obviously a quote, a quota allocation uh, that the government has every year. And that quota has to be split between these general draws and these category-based draws. The focus right now for the government is on these category-based draws on selecting candidates that have the skill sets to fill in Canada labor market um, shortages. And for that, we're seeing a swift in scores. So we're seeing the general draw score go up and the category-based draw score go down. Um, at the end of the day, it's a system of supply and demand, and we'll see in the next couple of slides uh, for you to understand what's been the trend for, for this uh, draws. So one of the main requirements, of course, is to be eligible to have that express entry profile, be eligible under one of the programs that I just mentioned, um, but specifically to be uh, considered under one of this draw, we need to have six months of continuous experience in the past three years. So again, on top of having, you know, the one year in the past uh, 10 years of experience for the federal school worker, the one year in the past three years uh, for the Canadian experience class, we need to have six months out of that qualified experience that we're already considering, six months of experience in one of these in-demand occupations in order to uh, be eligible uh, to be considered here. Now, the categories for this year, this is something also very important to understand, is that the categories may change every year. For now, what they've said for 2023 are the ones listed here, but this may change next year or even on a quarterly basis as they go on with this draws. Please remember that this was just introduced end of June, so um, it is a fairly recent um, selection criteria. 
just over a month and a half. So uh, bear with us as we continue to understand the trend. Uh, but so far, we have a good idea of, of where the government is heading. So first and foremost, probably the biggest focus of the government at the moment, French proficiency. Um, we've been advising this for years. We've been seeing this coming uh, for a long time now. And we'll see a couple more changes um, in the next slide. Uh, but this is great news for Francophone speaker, French speakers, French educated nationals, um, or anyone who has some sort of French proficiency that could um, get to the required level and be selected under one of the draws here. French language proficiency, we're talking about a CLB7, which is an upper intermediate level of French um, or a B2. Um, again, there's no specific experience requirement for this category. We just need to demonstrate that French level proficiency and have an active express entry profile and be within the selection range, which we'll see it's quite, quite low. Um, and then here we go with the specific um, occupation list. We have healthcare occupations. There's a list of which positions are included here. If you have questions, you have experiences, any of this, and you want to check it, you can always send us an email and uh, we'll be happy to assist you. STEM occupations. Here we're looking at anything from science, technology, engineering, and mathematic occupations. The list here is quite long. Um, and it's also been a, a priority for the government over the past few years. Trade and transportation occupations, also very big. And lastly, but not least, agriculture and agri-food occupations. Not so big the list here, but these positions will most likely keep changing as, as time goes by. So um, it is exciting. It's exciting for um, those who have experience in these categories. Um, and it may be uncertain for those who don't have experience in these categories, but are still qualified, have a strong score on their express entry, um, may be time to look at other options, other avenues, such as provincial or mini programs that are still not NOC specific, that are not occupation specific, um, based on, for example, having job offers or certain experience in that province. Um, but let's look at those uh, draws to show you what's been the trend so far. And apologies, I know we're missing the most recent um, drop for uh, trades, uh, which took place earlier this week, uh, but I'll give you the details in a second. So since the draw started, these are only for category-based draws, no uh, general draws. Uh, we've seen so far healthcare, STEM, three French ones, and uh, one trades. Clearly the focus has been French, just on the French category based alone, the government has issued over 5,000 invitations to apply in under one month, which is unbelievable. Um, and what's also unbelievable is how low the score was for uh, this specific draw where 3,800 invitations to apply were issued, 375 points. That we don't even require an advanced level of one of the languages to, to achieve that in combination of you know, being mid thirties, um, at least a bachelor's degree and our years of experience. Um, so what I come to say with this is that if you are French educated, if you have at least a B2, that CLB7 in French proficiency, this may be your time to open an express entry profile and be considered as a candidate for this category based draws because we're not, the government is not being so picky on the, the score itself, what they really want is to attract those who speak French. Again, remember, this is for those intending to apply outside of Quebec, reside outside of Quebec. So if you have intentions to apply in Quebec, um, let's wait a few more slides and we'll show what um, opportunities we have there. But as you can see, they're being quite active over the past few weeks, uh, meaning that this will probably be their new focus on um, attracting those um, foreign nationals. And we'll try to do as many webinars as this as possible to keep you updated with these trends. Uh, but once again, what we start to see is that French is the focus for the government. And we also put together the invitations to apply under the general draw. There was another one updated since then uh, that we have not had the time to update here, but the last cutoff score was 517 points. So this just keeps increasing. 
Um, as I said, I don't expect it to go down below the 500 anytime soon and definitely not under the 490 points since they will continue to focus on those category-based draws. So it will not replace the general draws, but it will become more challenging to get invited under the general draws if we don't have a score above 500 points. Um, we want to quickly go over the points breakdown and how we can maximize that score, specifically with language proficiency, like I was mentioning in the earlier slide. If we can master one of the official languages at an advanced level, we can double our points for transferability um, and their works present through profile. Just to give you an, ex an example, uh, we're looking at three years of experience, but in one case, we're looking at a CLB7 at an intermediate level of English or French. We get 25 points for transferability, whereas if we have the same amount of experience with an advanced level of CLB9, we're looking at 50 points. The same goes with education, bachelors with intermediate 13, bachelors with advanced 25, and two or more post-secondary degrees or masters, what I was mentioning earlier before as well, with an advanced level, we get 50 points. So try to maximize always one of the scores to uh, one of the languages to that advanced level um, to make sure we are getting all the points, if not most, um, out of the, the language proficiency factor. All right, um, very quickly over this, what's considered a qualified foreign work experience under the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Uh, it needs to have been continuous work experience, at least in one occupation for over one year. So 12 months of at least 30 hours per week. That's what's considered full-time in Canada. In a NOC tier zero, one, two, or three, we can count internships as long as they were paid. So it has to be paid work experience. And if we have obtained this experience on a part-time basis, we have to double the time that we're taking into consideration. Okay. Um, very important as well is if the proof of funds specifically for the federal skilled workers. So if we don't have any Canadian work experience, we're not going through the Canadian experience class, we will have to demonstrate funds based on our family size. Um, these are the, up, the most updated numbers, but these change every year. So always keep an eye on what the updated minimum fund number is. Uh, these were updated this year, so uh, we don't expect, expect it to increase until next year. Very important is that in order to demonstrate these funds, we need to demonstrate that they are readily available. Um, so either a check-in or savings accounts. And if we are immigrating with our partner or our spouse, we can use shared bank accounts, um, preferably uh, that show both names. If not, sponsorship letter would be sufficient as long as it's our spouse who is accompanying us to Canada. Um, and we need to do so through um, bank balance letter and bank statements for the past six months to prove to the officer that the funds have been readily available and they're not just there for demonstration purposes. Very important as well, and we can mistake that we see quite a lot from um, clients and just people in general, is that the, mon the money, the funds have to be there at the time that we land in Canada. So even if our application is approved, an officer at the border may request that updated bank statements to verify that that money that was presented is indeed still there. All right. Now, looking specifically into how we can enter into that Canadian experience class, how can we get that Canadian work experience that can give us some points? Um, there are many ways to do so. Um, we have grouped here the main or some categories because they're not, these are not even the main, these are just some categories of work permits that we see. Um, in Canada, we have two types of work permits, open work permits, which are open in nature. They have no restriction on the employer position or hour of, hours of time per um, work. We are looking, for example, under this category at the post-graduation work permit, which is uh, which one can apply for after graduating from a public institution in Canada. But then we also have closed work permits, which are issued based on having a job offer. And this job offer can either be sponsored by an LMIA or can be supported by an LMIA exemption code, uh, which we're going to discuss in the next few slides. How do we get an LMIA? An LMIA stands for a labor market impact assessment. It's pretty much employer sponsorship. Um, being sponsored by a Canadian employer in Canada. 
It is not as hectic of a process as many think, but it's important to understand how it works and make sure that the employer is willing to comply with the requirements and support you throughout the application. We have to get a job offer from a Canadian employer and the wage offer has to meet the median wage for that position in the region being offered. So that's something that we can check with you as well. We need to advertise or the employer needs to advertise the position for four consecutive weeks and invite for an interview to all those Canadian citizens and permanent residents only who meet all the requirements of the job post to, um, to apply for an interview and apply for the position. He will have to, or she will have to interview those candidates and uh, prepare a report or yeah, prepare an outcome of their findings of this recruitment period and submit it to ESDC. ESDC will be the employment branch of the government um, in charge of reviewing this application. It is not immigration. Um, so once the application is reviewed with ESDC, if they consider that it will have a positive impact in the Canadian labor market, hiring a foreign national, then they'll go ahead and give a positive LMIA. With that positive LMIA, we can go and apply for the work permit. So it's a two-step process, um, processing time for everything, really varies by country, but we're looking at at least four to six months uh, between the LMIA and the work permit. But there's something very interest that we, interesting that we have and that we'll discuss in, the, um, in two slides from now, which are LMIA exemption codes. And if we meet certain requirements, um, either from being a national of a country that has a free trade agreement with Canada or speaking a certain level of French and having a job offer outside of Quebec, our employer may not need to go through this recruitment process, may not be required to do um, an LMIA application and can go directly to apply for the work permit. Uh, with this work experience, what we can also do is once become, we become a worker and we're still accumulating experience, qualified work experience in Canada can give us anything from 40 to 60 points in our express entry profile, which is quite a lot. Having studied in one of the public institutions in Canada can give us anything from 15 to 30 points, depending on the length of the program. Having French language proficiency will give us 50 points points in bonus points plus 12 points for having a second language that's 62 points which is more than what we would get for having a job offer in a tier one two or three um, in Canada so keep that in mind we'll talk about French proficiency in the next slide but um, very very important to understand and compare put into perspective how French can really um, help us at a federal level um, job offers supported by an LMIA can give us anything from 50 points or 200 if it's in an executive senior position. And lastly, receiving a provincial nominee nomination, we would have an additional 600 points that will pretty much um, guarantee us that invitation to apply in the next round. How do we utilize that French? How do we use that French uh, for immigration purposes? What I was just mentioning, the bonus points that we get for French um, are 50. Uh, this was announced over almost three years ago uh, during the pandemic. It was doubled, it used to be 25 and they doubled it to 50. But like I was just saying, on top of these bonus points, we also get points for um, having French as a second language. So 12 additional points, a total of 62 points if we obtain French at a CLB7, at an upper intermediate B2 level, in combination with an intermediate level of English, B1 or a CLB5. Um, and then of course, be eligible to have that express entry profile. What's very interesting and also very new that has been uh, revised and amended also in the past month is the LMI exemption code C16. Uh, just like I was saying, if we have certain circumstances, if we are nationals from certain countries, we may be exempted from meeting that requirement from ESCC from the employer, and we can directly apply for the work permit without the need of that sponsorship. We would need a job offer. This job offer needs to be submitted through an IRCC employer portal by our employer, but it is a fairly easier process than an LMIA and less time consuming. Now, what's very exciting about this is that the level required um, uh, to demonstrate in French proficiency for this work permit used to be a CLB7, used to be an upper intermediate, a B2, what we've been seeing so far in the past few slides. 
but this was just lowered down to an intermediate or upper basic level of French, um, a CLB5, which would be around a B1. And the job offer can be in any occupation outside of Quebec. It used to be restricted to qualified occupations only, 0, 1, 2, 3. And this just got changed to any occupation. This really opened the doors for many skilled workers outside of Canada um, to be able to apply for that closed work permit, having a job offer without the need of a labor market impact assessment, without sponsorship. Um, it falls under the International Mobility Program, more specifically under the Francophone Mobility. Um, and once again, this is code C16. If you think you have this level, a potential job offer, or you just have more questions about it, please um, email us. I'll give the contact details at the end of, of the presentation. But it's a really great opportunity for those of you who already have some sort of France, French proficiency level. All right. Um, in line with French, um, I also want to explain really quick how provincial nominee programs work. We gave an initial overview in the first few slides, but I'll go a little more in detail with um, the, the four available options. Full disclaimer here, there are more options than this, but we've grouped this based on the, the trend that we see across provinces. Um, so we tend to see programs for most provinces under what we call in-demand occupations, so having experience in specific occupations. And this is pretty much what the government, federal government, has copied and pasted this model at an express entry level. So selecting those candidates based on experience, again, outside of Quebec. All of these options, by the way, are outside of Quebec. Whenever we're talking about provincial nominee programs, we're looking at outside Quebec. Uh, we can also consider a provincial nominee program if we have a job offer in uh, one of the provinces by uh, an eligible employer, also in a qualified occupation. And this does not mean a sponsorship. This does not mean LMIA. Um, in most cases, it's a written job offer. We can also consider one of these programs through our work experience with an employer in that province. Some will require nine months, some will require a year, um, and some in certain occupations. And lastly, as I mentioned, if we were to study in a public institution, uh, public college, public university for at least eight months in uh, one of the provinces, some provinces will require one year diploma, others will require two. We would have to look at this case by case, uh, but in a public institution, uh, we can also consider this as an avenue. Oh, did I miss? Oh, here, all right. Um, and just before we wrap up federal and provincial programs and we finalize with ARIMA with um, Quebec, um, another highlight I want to bring up today, which is a program that uh, we've been uh, very excited about for many years. Um, and a lot of our clients has, have successfully immigrated to Canada under this program. I'm talking about the um, Ontario Immigrant Immigrant Program for French speaking skilled workers. Um, it was some sort of on pause during the pandemic um, and was only selecting candidates within a specific score range or that had um, experience in a specific NOx. It just restarted back to selecting candidates um, under general draws, meaning that no specific experience is required. Um, it's a program that works along with express entry. So we need to have a valid express entry profile in order to be eligible. We need to have at least a bachelor's degree uh, whether that's completed outside or inside Canada, at least one year of experience in a qualified occupation. Again, not as specific to what's in demand or not, just one year of experience and have proficiency at both English and French. So it requires us to have an upper intermediate level in French. So that's CLB7 in French and an intermediate CLB6 level in English. So the combination of these two languages with that bachelor's degree, that year of experience, and having an express entry profile, uh, we can be eligible under this provincial nominee program. Let's look at the scores here because this is very, very exciting. The last draw took place a couple of weeks ago, July 25th. It was a general draw. As you can see, since June of last year, they had become targeted draws only to health, finance, education, and tech and trace position. So this was a big, big um, change. Um, definitely positive news for, for all those French speakers. But what's even more exciting is the score. 
the minimum score uh, that was selected under this draw is of 321 points, which is fairly low compared to what we tend, used to see during the pandemic. It got up to the 480s last year. Um, so being now at 321, uh, is, it's really exciting for those who, who do qualify for this program. Okay. Now let's jump into Quebec and then we'll move on to the questions. I know some of you may have some questions, so I will not make you wait any further. Um, all right, so just like we mentioned, Express Entry selects candidates who intend to reside outside of Quebec, point-based system, similar system um, Quebec adopted, it's called ARIMA. We also create an expression of interest where we declare certain factors and we get allocated a score. Now the scores um, and the selection factors are different from those um, in Express Entry. Here we're looking at specifically the field of education, a specific education that we have will get more or less points for these fields, for example. Um, and some programs may require a spouse to have certain level of French as well. But in all cases, French is highly demanded and will most likely be a requirement for uh, most of, of the programs. Under the skilled worker program, uh, which we become eligible for once we open that expression of interest and become candidates, um, we, need, we, we need a high level of French proficiency uh, in order to get selected based on the most recent range or have at least a job offer outside the Montreal uh, metropolitan area or experiencing one of the in-demand occupations. Uh, you'll see that the frequency of the draws and the quantity of invitations issued is now not close to that of Express Entry. But again, remember, we're talking about just one province here, whereas the rest we're talking about many provinces and territories. Uh, but it has become a very um, competitive space over the past few months, specifically after the pandemic. It works in a very similar way um, as provincial nominee programs. So once we receive the CSQ, the selection certificate from the province, we go ahead and apply for the provincial nominee program. Um, there are other two programs, uh, or there's another temporary program, I'd say, it's not temporary, actually, it's permanent, but it is designed for those who are in Quebec um, as temporary residents. So we have the PEQ, the Program of Experience in Quebec, if we translate, um, if we translate it to English, which requires us to have an upper intermediate level of French, requires us to have experience under one of the uh, types of work permits, so not as a student, under work permit. We need to have 24 months, so that's two years of experience under one of these work permits in the past three years preceding the application and in a qualified occupation tier 0, 1, 2, or 3. Okay, so this one focuses on the experience that we obtain in Quebec as workers. And there's another one very equivalent to uh, this one, but for international students. We have one for undergraduate post-secondary students who complete diplomas that are at least two years in duration, 18 hours. And on top of that, we need to complete a year and a half, 18 months in experience. And we also have the graduate one uh, for those who complete master's and PhD. The main difference here would be that the, um, the experience requirement gets cut down to 12 months instead of 18. And I believe that brings me to the end of the slides here. Just a quick reminder that um, every process, every profile is different. If you're really struggling or doubting on your options and you're unsure, um, you can talk to us about our immigration and assessment, um, sorry, immigration consultation and assessment services. Uh, we look at your profile, we prepare scenarios that are tailored to your case, and we sit down over a consultation to talk to you about these possible scenarios and um, most, Im most importantly, what are the next steps to start this journey and uh, the plan to immigrate to Canada? You can do so by, by scheduling a consultation on our website, or you can send us an email at the um, contact details that I will leave at the end of the call. But in all cases, if you don't know where to start, you can always send us an email with your um, circumstances, your questions, your inquiries, and then we'll walk you from there into what service, um, or even if we could assist you or not in your case, okay? Um, this is just about the consultation. All right, so let's dive in into Q&A. Uh, don't be shy, please ask out your questions, uh, whether these have to do with uh, your own immigration pathway, anything that I um, explained here today, um, or any other doubts that you came in today's session with. 
uh, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll give a few minutes. Um, but yeah, I hope to, to read out some questions here. I see that it's already gotten here. Uh, yes, for sure. Hello, Maria. Uh, Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for your message. For sure. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. I have a quick question for you. I don't know if you are able to go back to the slide about the international student PEQ uh, requirements, please. Yes. Thank you. So from what I understood, um, one of the requirements is that I should graduate from a, I should have a diploma that is a two years and more, right? Correct. And that's the equivalent to 1800 hours in the province of Quebec. Okay. So I graduated from Greystone College, Montreal. Mm -hmm. When I graduated, it was like uh, the requirement was one year, I believe. And so I'm wondering right now if I apply for the PEQ today, will I have to go under these right. requirements or the previous ones when I graduated? So there's a cut of date that I don't have in mind right now, but there's a cut of date. There were transition measures put in place for those who were cut off in the process. Um, and again, that date will specify that if you graduated um, before or up until that date, you could still apply under the PEQ with the old requirements. So that was with one year of experience and 900 hours of studies. Uh, yep. But if it was the graduation day to place after that date, then the new measures will apply and we would have to follow these requirements here. Okay, and, and you don't have those those dates, right? I don't have it in mind right now. Um, I believe it was sometime in 2020, but um, if, you, if you are interested about it, you can send us an email and I'll be happy to confirm. Thank you, Maria. I graduated on uh, December 2019. So okay. maybe I did right. Most likely, yes, but again, I don't want to give you a wrong, a wrong answer here, um, but there's there's a good chance that uh, you can still apply under the old measures. Okay, I have a second question. Um, so sure, we just, if you don't mind, I'll be answering, because uh, there's more questions here, I'll be yeah. answering the others first, and then if we have more time, I'll come back to it. Okay. Okay, no okay thank, thank you. you. Perfect, all right. Isabel um, is asking us, I studied Wow, that's a very long name. Pharmacobiologist, chemist as my bachelor in Mexico, five years plus a thesis. I'm in the process of obtaining the study equivalency with West. Do you think if this is one is considered as a bachelor or under health category based? Really, really good question. So um, these are two completely different topics um, that we have to, to look at. They are related in a way, but uh, from an immigration perspective, they're assessed differently. So from an immigration perspective, unless you have obtained uh, or you're a doctor in a foreign country and you have that, um, that doctor degree, um, we have, or you're a pharmacist, um, here we would have to look specifically at the degree that you obtained, but you either would have to go through the pharmacy broad or through West. Now, now this is a pharmacy, right, okay. So then you may have to go to the Pharmacy uh, Board of Canada to do the equalization, but this is different from um, the actual level of studies. So you would go through the Pharmacy's Board of Canada if the experience that you have, if you have practiced as a pharmacist after graduating and you're claiming points for that experience as a pharmacist. In that case, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do well, so you would have to go through the Pharmacy Board of Canada and get your equivalency through there. Only if you practice as a pharmacist in a specific NOC. They mentioned the specific NOC of the pharmacist. Um, I recommend you to go check and, and confirm that that's your NOC. But if you worked at something else um, or in another position that's not that, then West is the right um, place to do it. And with West, uh, what you will get is the equivalency of your level of education. Now, once you have that level of education, you can claim points for that. And once you open your express entry profile with those points, the level of education, the, the years of experience, you may be eligible under the health category based if you're not, if your experience is in uh, one of the listed in demand occupations. So two different steps, getting the equalization of your level of education, we may have to go through the pharmacy board if we practiced as pharmacists and we're claiming that experience in our express entry profile. 
or if we're just looking at the level of education, we can go through West, get that accredited, open our express entry profile. And let's say you may have, you have those, for example, three, four years of experience. If out of those uh, three, four years, you have at least six months in one of the in-demand occupations, regardless of that level, you would get selected if you're within the score range and you have those six months, okay? Uh, perfect, you're welcome. And then Seiman also asked us, if I am bilingual, if I am bilingual, do I need to apply for the Ontario program or should I do the Express Entry Pro and I will get the point? Great question. And the answer is that you can do both. Why? Because the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program works with Express Entry. So our recommendation for those who are French speakers is get your test done as soon as possible, both English and French. French is a priority here, at least at that upper intermediate level open that express entry profile. So make sure we also have the ECA done, our foreign work experience confirmed. Open that express entry profile. And then once you are a candidate in the pool, you will be a candidate for both programs. You'll be a candidate under the federal level. So through one of the French category-based draws, but you'll also become a candidate under the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program because this program selects candidates straight from express entry. So by opening that express entry profile, you suddenly have more than one option uh, to get selected and invited. And our recommendation here would be whichever invitation comes first, take that one and prepare and follow for that application, okay? Um, all right, and then I'll answer this last one and go back to Sergio's question. Uh, also, do I need to put the money in the bank in multiple entries or can I put it at once because in my country, yes. So I'm assuming you are from Lebanon. Uh, we're very, or if not, uh, please apologies, but I, I am very familiarized with the situation and the banking um, situation in Lebanon at the moment. Um, whenever it comes to the bank account, um, we have to unfortunately demonstrate that the money has been there for a certain amount of time. Now, if the exact money, let's say the 13,500 that we require are not there for exactly the past six months, uh, we need to demonstrate to the officer that we've acquired these funds um, in a realistic way, as in you have not just transferred all this money all at once for demonstration purposes, Unfortunately, I know that's the, the reality for many nationals in Lebanon at the moment, but we don't want to show to the officer that our funds were not available prior to the application and that they are there for, we, we didn't borrow these funds from someone just to demonstrate and then we'll return them back. So they want to know that the funds are yours and they're available under your name. So uh, whether you decide to put it all at once we would have to then explain where the funds came from. We would have to provide more documentation of all your pay stubs, transactions, um, pretty much all your history that led you to have that cash and later on put into that bank account. So that would require more amount of documentation, but it's possible. Or deposit that money slowly uh, or gradually in a way that we can show to the officer that we've acquired this over time. It comes from employment. Um, it could also, for example, come from sale of property, sale of um, cars, motorcycle, anything, anything that you can think of. But then again, we would require that documentation to prove where the money came from. So um, last option, and I know it's not available for everyone, but it's worth saying it. If you have the option of opening a bank account in uh, Dubai or any of the neighboring countries, um, that's also something recommended. Put your money there, leave it there for those six months while you prepare for languages, ECA experience. And then once you're ready to open that express entry profile, have had that money there for those four to six months while you wait for the invitation to apply. Okay. Um, all right. And then, so here, if you want, you can go ahead and ask your second question that uh, we had to leave behind earlier. Um, you can unmute yourself, Sergio, or type it here. Let me see. All right. Okay. I think he left. So anyways, um, okay. Thank you all for attending the presentation. The recording will be ready in a couple hours. If you want to go through it, if you want the slides, please make sure to email us. I'll leave our contact details here. 
um, you can send us an email to connect.incubate.ca and then we'll be happy to assist you, guide you, and at least um, inform you of how we can help you. Uh, once again, thank you so much for attending. I hope it was informative for everyone and we'll be hosting more of this as more news and more trends come up, okay? Um, thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.